Uh, good evening everyone, uh, this is Abhishek here from Indian International MUN and uh, welcome all of you to the third training session of the Indian International MUN USA. Before we begin, I'd just uh, quickly like to take your attendance. All of you who are attending this third session, I'd just request you to write the name of your school and your full name before we begin. Hello everyone, um, we'll just wait for a few minutes, a couple of minutes till everyone just uh, logs in and puts down their full name and school name as just attendance and then we can begin with the third session. Sorry that you guys have to stare at this uh, ugly face for this long. I'll just wait till 6 or 5 pm and then I'll begin. Also, just a few simple instructions before I begin with the session is at any point in time if you require certain clarification or if you have a query please use the comment section below to get in touch with me you can ask your query and i'll address them Uh, I got a query from Rithik, uh, wasn't there going to be any event in Pathan Court? Uh, I guess there is going to be a conference in Pathan Court. The event page or the Facebook page for the chapter will definitely be up and running if it not already is and details would be displayed on that. In the meanwhile, if we will just uh, quickly begin with the rules of procedure training 
training number three for you guys uh, just want to take a quick recap from last time i believe you all had left off with unmoderated caucus and that was the last point that you have done from the rules of procedure clause number 20 and i'll be resuming from clause 21 which is working papers that's right so everyone's clear Everyone is clear till unmoderated caucus, then I'll begin today's session from working paper. Yes, uh, I've got a query from Subhashish that says, if you could please elaborate on resolution making. Uh, we'll definitely be covering the point of resolution today. And after that, of course, also there is the rules of procedure which is available on the IM1 main page, which is www.iimun.in, in which you can just go through the document and all explanation of how exactly a resolution is made is provided in the document as well all right certain problems with a signal actually that's not something i can take care of but i'm sure that with time the connection will become all right there are in overall overall about 30 38 clauses and we'll be resuming from clause number 20 so we just have to cover 18 clauses today which should not take much of our times much of our time sorry okay i have a query and with that i'll just begin the session um, can you explain unmoderated caucus again basically uh, what is an unmoderated caucus like the uh, name suggests an unmoderated caucus is a session which is unmoderated which means that your executive board is not directly moderating this session with any points or any formal proceedings it's an unmoderated caucus which means it's an informal session wherein students rather delegates are allowed to get up from their seats and discuss with co-delegates different points that they want to put together say for example in a working paper so normally the cycle goes this way you first discuss a particular subtopic in a moderated caucus which is say a maximum of 15 minutes you discuss a particular subtopic and once you're done with discussion you you've had in a moderated caucus you had verbal discussion basically on a subtopic once you want to convert that verbal discussion into paper so you want to pen down all the points that you discussed so when you want to pen down all the points you've discussed you basically have to raise a motion to enter into an unmoderated caucus wherein you'll get say the maximum duration for an unmoderated caucus is 15 minutes which means that you get 15 minutes wherein you can all get up you can form your blocks you can discuss the points that were discussed in the moderated caucus and use these 15 minutes to actually pen down a working paper or a resolution which is then displayed in front of committee so I hope I've been able to explain that. Moving on, um, the next point is working paper. So like I said, in the unmoderated caucus, you are given a maximum of 15 minutes of informal session. What is a working paper? A working paper is basically when you put, when you take a piece of paper and you put down solutions to your discussions that you had in the moderated caucus so say for example you discussed a, a particular subtopic in a moderated caucus so that that means you've had a verbal discussion on that topic but you need to obviously put it down in document or you need to have it somewhere written so that those points are not forgotten and those points are taken forward and then added to the resolution so a working paper is basically the views that the committee has on a particular subtopic so it helps to provide direction to the committee and it does not have any prescribed format so working paper can be as simple as a piece of paper which can be titled say working paper 1.0 or working paper 1.1 and before you introduce it into committee it just needs to be handed over to the chair for approval so in order to be discussed it needs a simple majority and then it is automatically introduced on the floor so if i for example i'm a delegate of a particular country in an unmoderated caucus 
I have made a working paper. I have shown it to the chairperson. He has approved it. Then we move back into formal session and the executive board member asks for any points or motions on the floor. So I raise my placard and say motion to introduce working paper 1.0. Then the executive board member will ask the rest of the committee how many of them are for this motion. If there is simple majority which is 50% plus 1, then automatically this working paper is passed in the sense it's passed to be discussed. It's not passed and voted upon. It's just that the committee has agreed that this working paper should be read out and discussed in committee. Now in the case in an unmoderated caucus, you have different countries, you have different blocks that are formed. So it's not necessary that only one working paper will be formed in an unmoderated caucus. You might have multiple working papers. In the case that you have more than one working paper, you will it is then left to the discretion of the chairperson which working paper should be discussed or put to discussion first or introduced to the floor first lastly any working paper after being introduced and debated upon once it is passed a working paper has to be incorporated in the resolution all right so that is working paper if you guys have any queries in regards to working paper um, please feel free to ask me. If you can just help me uh, in the comment section if you've understood about working paper. If you have then I'll just go forward with the next point. All right, uh, we have a comment which says, please repeat working paper. All right, I'll just do that quickly for you. All of those who weren't paying attention or had just joined in, I'll just explain what working paper is once again for all of those who couldn't hear. Basically, in a moderated, I'm going to go, I'll start from slightly a couple of points before. In a moderated caucus, you discuss a subtopic of the main agenda wherein you have 10 speakers, 5 speakers, 15 speakers who discuss on a subtopic of an agenda. So in a moderated caucus on discussing these subtopics, you come up with certain solutions or you come up with certain ways how you can combat this subtopic. So those solutions that you've come up with in a moderated caucus are verbal discussions. Verbal discuss discussions, like your pardon, verbal discussions have to then be converted into documentation. So basically whenever you convert your verbal discussions in a moderated caucus, you need an unmoderated caucus wherein all delegates then get up, form their blocks, discuss with each other and then they pen down all the points that they had just discussed in a moderated caucus. Now when you pen down all these points and you find out solutions to a problem, that piece of paper that you put together with the solutions is the view of the committee towards a particular subtopic and that is a working paper. So working paper has points in no prescribed format. It has points of solutions to a subtopic and that working paper is first after being prepared is shown to the executive board member for approval. On gaining approval it can be introduced to committee debated and discussed upon and then put to voting. So in order to introduce it to committee it requires simple majority and in order to pass a working paper it requires simple majority as well. It can be done by an informal way by just the show of placards and you must keep in mind that every working paper that passes in committee has to be incorporated in the resolution. Alright, so that was working paper. Can I move on to the next point which is uh, resolution? Yeah. 
Yes, uh, on your working paper, the reason why your working paper is actually given to the chairperson before you actually introduce it to committee is one to just read out the chairperson will read the working paper and he will know who the authors are. So he will read the working paper and he will also mark you on it. So as much as your debating and your diplomacy skills are marked upon and your discussion and your public speaking is marked upon, equal if not more importance is also given to the paperwork that you do in committee. So irrespective of whether the working paper passes or fails, if you put in good points and your executive board has noticed that, you'll definitely get your marks for paperwork. Moving on to the next point, clause number 22 of the IM and rules of procedure is resolution. I'm sure uh, being associated with being associated, beg your pardon, with an MUN conference, you guys are definitely sure or at least have heard of the term resolution. What is resolution? It is basically a solution to the entire agenda. So a solution to your main topic or your agenda is called as a resolution. Just like a working paper, even a resolution has points of solution to a problem. The only thing is a working paper talks about solutions to small topics and subtopics. Whereas a resolution is a compilation of all working papers that have passed as well as other solutions to points. A working paper on the other hand has no prescribed format. whereas a resolution does have a prescribed format. <clears throat> it requires minimum of one author and three signatories. So I'll repeat that for you. A resolution requires a minimum of one author and three signatories. Irrespective of the council that you are representing. So if IMN is if if any IMN affiliated conference is simulating say even a FIFA committee, a Lok Sabha committee, a UNHRC, a BCCI, any committee, this uh, minimum requirement of one author and three signatories stays standard all across. So basically what is an author, who is an author and who is a signatory, what do those two terms mean? An author of course is the person who writes the resolution. So the person who actually formulates the resolution is known as the author. One thing to be kept in mind is that an author cannot vote against his own resolution. I mean of course why would he or why would she? But an author is someone who formulates a resolution and cannot vote against that resolution whilst on the other hand a signatory is someone who consents or who gives their consent to discuss this particular resolution. So let me just give you an example so that you don't get confused between a signatory and an author. An author is someone who formulates the resolution and cannot vote against it. Whereas a signatory is a person who is just becoming a signatory to give their consent that they want this particular resolution to be discussed in committee. So it is not mandatory that a signatory has to vote yes or has to vote no for a particular resolution. A signatory may vote yes or may vote no. So if there are six signatories to a resolution, all six of them might vote no, all six of them might vote yes. They might have a balance of three and three. But my basic point to communicate here is that do not mistaken that if you are a signatory to a resolution, it means that you have to vote yes. It is not that. You can vote either yes or no. By being a signatory to the resolution, you are only giving your consent that you have gone through this resolution and you feel that committee time should be used to discuss this particular resolution. Okay, I hope I'm audible to you guys. Am I loud enough?
All right, moving forward, a resolution. A resolution basically, like I said, requires prior approval before it is introduced in the committee. So just like a working paper where you need to just show it to the executive board member before you introduce it to committee, a resolution too needs to be first given to the chairperson for approval and signature and then can be introduced in committee. So the voting on introduction of the resolution can be done through informal in an informal manner. However, in order to pass a resolution, it requires two-third majority. All right, so let me repeat that for you. If you, in order to introduce a resolution on the floor or in order to introduce a resolution to committee, your informal voting is required and you get a simple majority and that way the resolution is introduced on the floor for discussion. But in order to pass a resolution, it requires two-third majority of your committee strength. Alright, so that is resolution. I hope all of you have understood resolution. And then I'll just move, I'll just take a minute's pause here for any queries that you might have. And I'll continue with the next point, which is amendments and amendments. Alright, so I have a query here. Is there a resolution for every subtopic or for the whole agenda? Alright, let me just put it this way. Say for example, um, you are in committee right now. You are in committee right now and you are discussing a particular agenda. Now, uh, an agenda is a vast topic be it discussion on global warming, be it discussion on climate change, be it discussion on Kashmir conflict, be it discussion on India's bid for a permanent seat in the Security Council or any, any and every topic that is being discussed in your conferences is vast. So it's not easy to directly find a solution to such a vast problem. So what we do is first we break down the main agenda into smaller subtopics and address those subtopics in a moderated caucus. So say you have a dissect committee and you're discussing the arms race. So first you cannot directly address the entire topic at once. You might have to discuss subtopics. What are subtopics? You might have to discuss a con which countries, um, I mean, which countries have arms in excess of what the actual limit is. You might have to discuss measures to control such countries, things like that. So uh, basically your main agenda has to be broken down into subtopics in order to discuss it and find solution to subtopics. So you have a big problem, you're breaking it down into small problems and then you're solving each small problem and you're formulating a working paper on each small problem. So for every subtopic that you discuss in a moderated caucus, you will also form a working paper on that subtopic. And then suppose now you have an agenda, you broke it down, say for example, into five subtopics and discussed it over five moderated caucuses. Then you in the unmoderated caucus form five working papers. Those working papers are for individual subtopics but whereas a resolution is a compilation of these working papers. So a resolution is only one and it is only for the main agenda whereas a working paper is more than one and is for each subtopic. So have you understood that now?
and uh, once this uh, session is over basically uh, since this is facebook live this entire thing will go up live on the page so you can watch the video even after so if you've just joined in and you have some queries as to what a working paper is or what is the difference between a working paper and a resolution once the session is over automatically a video will be posted which you can go back to and find out the difference between the two or any point that you missed you can just play the video all right uh, so we've discussed working paper and resolution now we'll move on to the next point which is amendment the next point is amendment i'm sure you guys have heard of this term multiple times be it in school or college or in your books what is amendment amendment in normal layman language is basically a particular change that you want to bring so if there's something that's incorrect you want to amend that that means you want to rectify it you want to make it right you feel something is wrong so you want to make amends to it so that's basically what an amendment is now there are two types of amendments in an mun competition as per the iman rules of procedure the two types of amendments are friendly amendment and normal amendment so what is amendment amendment is basically a particular a basically an edit or a change that you want to bring about in say a working paper or a resolution so there are two ways in which you can do that one is a friendly amendment and one is a normal amendment now what is a friendly amendment a friendly amendment is one which is agreed upon by the authors of the of the resolution and does not require any voting so that basically means suppose if i am a delegate in the committee and the resolution has just been read out and discussed but i felt that in a particular point of the resolution there is a change that i feel is required so i raised my black card and i raised for an amendment if that amendment that i have asked for is accepted and agreed upon by the author of the resolution then it becomes a friendly amendment and the change is made in the committee and reread to the entire committee after the amendment is made and thus requires no voting on the other hand apart from friendly amendment there is something called as normal amendment what is normal amendment in the case that the author of the resolution does not agree upon the amendment that i have asked for then it requires the committee to go into voting for that amendment so it's as simple as this if you are writing something and i told you i have told you that you made a mistake here you need to change this this does not sound right so as a student if you say okay yeah this actually does not sound right i'll just change it so then that's like your friendly amendment you've accepted that okay yeah this person what this person is saying is right let's change it on the other hand when you say no what i've written is right let me ask the views of others so that's a normal amendment wherein you say no what you are saying is not right but let's discuss it in committee and let's put it to voting if everyone thinks that this amendment is required then we'll go forward with it so an amendment which is agreed upon by your author of a resolution is a friendly amendment and requires no voting well as a normal amendment is one that requires voting because it's not directly agreed to by the author of the resolution all right and now we'll move forward after amendment we have a point called emendment so amendment is a m 
E N D M E N T and E amendment is E M E N D M E N T S. All right. What is an E amendment? This is very simple. Basically, any grammatical error that you have identified and you want to rectify in the resolution is called an amendment. So the correction of grammatical error in a resolution is called an amendment and it does not require any voting but simple approval by the chair. So something as simple as a preposition incorrectly mentioned in a statement a comma or a full stop put in the wrong place of a statement a semicolon put somewhere else instead of where it's supposed to be grammatical errors that are made or deviations from the prescribed format of a resolution is called amendment so you identify that okay there is a particular prescribed format to make a resolution but there is this mistake in this format which is why there is a grammatical error so you raise a motion for amendment e amendment and the chair will approve it and it automatically the change is made all those who have just joined in uh, i would request you to be patient and allow the session to continue once the session is over the video will be posted and whatever you have missed you can watch it once the video gets posted and please do give your attendance on the group by typing your full name and your school name i'll just repeat what is e amendment e amendment is basically grammatical error that you have spotted in the resolution which requires to be changed simple as that any grammatical error that you see in a sentence or in a resolution which needs to be rectified and made correct is called as e amendment All right. Uh, I hope you guys have understood that. We'll move on to something called as emergency debate. I'm sure you guys, this is something that will excite you guys, because an emergency debate, like you know, is when there is a crisis in your committee. So be it the introduction of demonetization, be it the bombing that USA has carried out on Afghanistan, something that happens all of a sudden. and is introduced into your committee as a crisis or as an emergency is called the emergency debate so what i'm going to do is i'm going to be discussing with you the rules of procedure that are followed during an emergency debate so like in normal debate you had quorum speakers list yields points moderated caucus and moderated caucus working paper and resolution similarly like that in emergency debate considering there is a crisis that has just taken place there are a few changes to the rules of procedure that is followed in an emergency debate because of course an emergency has just taken place and you don't have all the time in the world to solve it which means during emergency debate you get only a maximum of one session which is 3 hours to solve that crisis your observers in the committee are asked to leave commit council and it's only the council or the committee members that that will be present in the room and are not allowed to leave the committee till the emergency debate is over all right i'm sure you guys have understood what is emergency debate okay quorum uh how many of you guys know what quorum is i am sure it was covered in previous sessions quorum is basically the minimum number of people that are required in a committee to start the proceedings of council so in emergency debate the quorum 
rests at one fifth of the member countries that are involved should be present. So in a particular topic or in a particular crisis or emergency, if there are 20 countries, 20 countries that are involved, then one fifth of the committee strength needs to be present in order to, for committee to begin its proceeding. So if you do the maths, pretty bad at maths, one fifth. Yeah, so if four people, four countries, four involved countries are present, then you can go forward with country proceedings, with committee proceedings. So your quorum is, sits at one fifth of committee strength. Quorum during an emergency debate is one fifth of the committee strength. All right, moving on to the next point is point number 26, which is called recognized speakers. So in your normal debate, you had something called as speakers list, wherein all countries would alphabetically speak A to Z for a duration of 90 seconds, right? This is a revision of normal debate. So in your normal debate, a speakers list is where countries are in A to Z, they speak in the alphabetical order starting from A and ending at Z for a period of 90 seconds where they talk about their country's stance on the particular agenda at hand. But now in an emergency debate, think about it, there is an emergency that's just taken place. Let's take a normal basic emergency. If there's something that's happened in the building or the building has caught fire, you won't take your own sweet time, right? You'll run away from the building, you'll go to some safe spot, you'll leave your belongings and you'll ensure that you're safe. Because the time that you have to save yourself, to save the citizens of your country, to save the world is limited. That's why in emergency debate, instead of having a speaker's list and allowing all countries to speak A to Z, we have something called recognized speakers, which means in an emergency situation, there will be no speakers list. Rather, the chairperson will recognize up to five individuals who will speak with compulsory yields in order of involvement towards the topic for a time period of one minute. So you see the difference between a speakers list in the normal debate and recognized speakers in emergency debate. In normal debate, you have everyone who speaks A to Z for 90 seconds each. Whereas out here, because the time is less and a crisis has hit the committee, instead of having everyone speak for 90 seconds, you have recognized speakers which go up to five speakers, which is selected by the chairperson in their order of involvement in the crisis. And instead of a minute and a half in the recognized speakers in the emergency debate, you get one minute. Alright, so I hope uh, you guys have understood what recognized speakers is. Alright, what is the point of amendment? Basically, amendment, like I said, is if there's any grammatical error in the resolution, you can just raise an amendment and send it send it via chit to the executive board member and it's it just requires the chairperson's approval and the grammatical error is then solved so there's nothing uh, really fancy about amendment it's just gram grammatical errors that you have spotted and you just rectify that all right um, now emergency debate we did quorum is one fifth there's a point called recognized speakers wherein only five speakers are recognized and spoken and are allowed to speak for a minute each with compulsory yields as compared to 90 seconds in, in an actual speakers list. The next is moderated caucus. In an emergency debate, the chair shall decide upon the topics of a moderated caucus as well as the time frame of the entire moderated caucus and the poor speaker time. So in normal debate, you had moderated caucus which could be decided by the delegates. The delegates could decide the duration of the time and the per speaker time. 
but in emergency debate the delegates do not decide which are the topics of moderated caucus but this is decided by the chairperson so your chairperson tells you that these are the moderated caucuses for this duration and this speaker time that is to be discussed and a maximum of 5 moderated caucuses are allowed all right uh, someone has asked to repeat recognize speakers so basically like i said in an emergency debate because there is a crisis at hand we cannot have all speakers speak just think about it if there's a crisis at home you automatically rush and want things to get done and you need to take care of everything similarly like that we have the concept of recognized speakers wherein on the basis of the crisis situation the chairperson will identify which are the top 5 most involved countries with that particular situation of crisis and those 5 countries are recognized to speak for a minute e each with compulsory yields so i hope uh, ketan you have understood what is recognized speakers under emergency or crisis all right uh, now moving forward we did recognize uh, we did quorum we spoke about recognized speakers and we spoke about moderated caucus the next point is points um points like you would have done earlier in normal debate there were four types of points which is point of personal privilege point of information point of order and point of parliamentary inquiry but in an emergency debate all your points are suspended for the duration of the emergency apart from that of point of personal privilege so all your points are suspended apart from point of personal privilege in emergency debate all right uh, how many points are left to explain there are about uh, 9 to 10 points left to explain it shouldn't take much time i hope you guys can be patient enough and stay if you have in a hurry the video as i have said uh, before will be uploaded on the page so you can definitely have a look at it even after the session is over uh i've got a question asking why i'm assuming your question is why are exactly these points suspended during emergency debate the reason as i said is simple during an emergency or during a crisis the time duration that you have at hand to solve that is a maximum of 3 hours that means your time should be utilized and focused upon in order to ensure that you are finding solution to the problem rather than doing anything else which is why we have reduced the points for just those 3 hours wherein all your points are suspended apart from point of personal privilege wherein you can focus and ensure that the agenda at hand is resolved rather the crisis at hand is solved all right the next thing is unmoderated caucus in normal debate like you would be knowing um you would usually have at least one unmoderated caucus in every session or after every cycle of a moderated caucus you would follow it up with an unmoderated caucus so you can get up form your blocks discuss amongst delegates and form a working paper but like i said in the emergency debate you the time that you have at hand is less so the unmoderated caucus is restricted to only one which means there shall only be one unmoderated caucus which is utilized in the formulation of a declaration so the unmoderated caucus in emergency debate is one that means one unmoderated caucus shall be utilized and this will be utilized for formulating the declaration all right um i'll just finish the next point which is declaration and we will then take a 5 minute break so all of you who want to go back into the session or just adjust your cameras or take a water break we can do that i'll just finish this point 
because it's the last point in emergency debate. Thank you for allowing me to do so. Uh, the last point in emergency debate and point 30 of the rules of procedure is declaration. So what exactly is a declaration? It is basically a combination of a working paper and a resolution but happens to be easy and faster. So you just combine your working papers and resolution and you submit it to the chairperson for approval in the same pres in the prescribed format as a resolution and it serves as a resolution itself but during emergency debate it's termed as declaration and it requires one author and three signatories an informal vote just like the resolution is enough to discuss or to decide which declaration should be discussed and for passing a declaration a f formal voting is required so declaration is simple it requires one author and three signatories to be introduced on the floor in committee it requires informal voting and in order to pass a declaration it requires formal voting what is formal voting is something that we will come to but as i promised we finished point 30 and we are done with all the points for emergency debate we have now eight points left to go which are rules common to both normal as well as emergency debate so these eight points we'll begin after a short break of five minutes so it's 647 by my watch we'll start at 652 and in the meanwhile you guys can just freshen up and adjust your cameras Uh, so what's tabling of a working paper? We'll be coming to the point of tabling Amish. Thank you for bringing it up Madhur, uh, I'm sorry if I repeated the same point again. I was just trying to be more clear and clarify it to the rest of the people and Ketan in the end can we have a revision? I am sure that at the end of this session you would be tired of my voice and my ugly face so we will definitely have a revision session it might not be today it might be during your next Facebook live session wherein an entire ROP crash course you can call it will be taken which will serve as a revision for everyone who might have missed or might not have understood a few points and yes uh, of course like I said these videos will get posted on this page for you all to view apart from that we also have the rules of procedure the document which is available on the main page of the website rather I mean the website which is www.iimun.in All right, are we ready to resume? I know only three minutes are over, but are we ready to resume? Uh, Dave, the next live stream would be informed to you when, whenever it is scheduled for next, it will be informed to you. In all likelihood, it should be on next Saturday. All right, uh, Amish. How is IAMAN ROP different from HMAN and UNA USA MUN? Uh, thank you for asking such an important question. The next set or rather the last eight points of the rules of procedure that I am going to be displaying, I am going to be discussing with you will automatically answer your question Amish as to how the IAMAN ROP is better and different from HMAN and UNA USA rules of procedure. In in respect to the points that we've already covered, how is the I am an ROP different? Let me tell you that um, in 
other rules of procedure or in other MU and competitions, you popularly uh, you would have heard of something called as general speakers list or GSL. Whereas in IMAN you would would not hear of the term GSL. You would hear of the term speakers list. So what's the difference between just the what is the difference between IMAN's speakers list and a general speakers list that might be used in other procedures? Is basically that in general speakers list, the executive board person recognizes the speaker, and then they are allowed to speak. Whereas in IMAN we follow a speakers list wherein all the countries are A to Z listed and speak one after the other in alphabetical order which means that it is mandatory and compulsory with the help of the speakers list for all countries to voice their opinions and speak up in committee whereas in a GSL you might be raising your placard all day long but if the executive board just does not recognize you you cannot speak because there is no provision for compulsory speaking which is provided in IMN speakers list alright moving on to other areas or rather rules common to both normal and emergency debate and this will also help answer the question of how IMN's ROP is better I rather is different from other ROPs. We have uh, clause number 31. It's called challenge. What exactly is a challenge? Basically, when one particular delegate has a dispute or has certain issues or discussions or problems with another delegate which they would like to solve, they can use this tool of the rules of procedure called challenge challenge helps the delegates to have a bilateral discussion on a multilateral forum um, okay there's a question that what is the name of the resolution basically you can name the resolution um, whatever you like there's no compulsory name of a resolution you can call it resolution 123 and that's also fine uh, moving on challenge what exactly is a challenge basically a challenge allows delegates to have a bilateral discussion on a unilateral forum so what exactly is a unilateral forum a unilateral forum is one which is the United Nations wherein there are different there are multiple countries who discuss on a to particular topic but what does IAMAN allow it allows bilateral discussion on this forum which means that with the help or with the use of challenge you can have a bilateral discussion which means you can have a one one v one discussion to solve a particular problem so say for example if USA and Russia are two opposing blocks hypothetically and they have to discuss a particular topic so instead of having the entire committee discuss it through a moderated caucus a delegate of USA can just directly challenge the delegate of Russia to a particular topic and they both can have a bilateral discussion instead of going into the entire flow of speaking on, on a I mean instead of speaking through a moderated caucus uh, there are a couple of questions I'll just address them as soon as I'm done with the point of challenge so just to finish it off uh, challenge is basically when one delegate challenges another delegate over a particular issue for a specific period of time and this may be over country policy or just a particular subtopic and it is one on one debate so a delegate how does a delegate enter into a challenge on when the executive board members ask for any points or motions the delegate has to raise their placard and say the following words motion to challenge the delegate slash delegation of XYZ country over ABC topic for a time duration of N number of minutes what is N number of minutes that's the number of minutes you want to challenge for 
now a challenge allows a maximum of three minutes so the maximum time duration for a challenge is three minutes wherein both the delegates come to the dais or come to the floor and they discuss with each other so it is an informal discussion it's not that first one speaker will speak for one and a half minutes he will finish and then the other can speak for the next one and a half minutes they can continue speaking tirelessly for three minutes both together but that would only create noise but of course there is no particular format that I have to speak for 90 seconds and then the opposite person speaks for 90 seconds ok so that's challenge I hope you guys have understood it the advantage of the challenge of course why how is IMN rules of procedure different is that a challenge allows you to have bilateral discussion rather than wasting a lot of time of committee and having to discuss it by a moderated caucus if you feel there are two countries that have a particular issue and that can be resolved with the help of a challenge that can be utilized all right and there were a couple of questions that we had in regards to this session what time will the session get over uh, there are just six to seven points left so you can safely assume that we would be done within 20 to 30 minutes on the other hand uh, in a double delegation committee do both delegations speak in the SL or only one is supposed to yeah so that's a good question so basically the 90 seconds in the speakers list is given to the country which means that both the speakers combined get 90 seconds to speak how they bifurcate that time can be left up to their discretion so if I am in a double delegation in the speakers list I would, dis I would give myself 45 seconds and give my partner 45 seconds but you can also do something like 60 seconds for me and 30 seconds for you so you can divide your the, your 90 seconds as per your whims and fancies all right is it formal or informal i've already answered yes it, it is compulsory for you to accept the challenge that another delegate has raised what happens at the end of a challenge basically so nothing happens at the end of a challenge as such but you have two delegates who have challenged each who have come to a challenge and discuss a particular solution and then they get back to the floor and then you can say for example go for voting now let me give you an example of where challenge can be used say for example I have introduced a working paper to the committee and I have read it out to the committee before I move into voting or before I raise a motion to vote on this working paper a particular delegate might want to challenge me on the working paper so say for example I am the delegate of USA who has just introduced and read out a working paper to the committee now after introducing I go back to my seat and the executive board member asks for points or motions at that point in time I might raise a motion to directly enter voting on this working paper but another delegate say a delegate of Russia would raise his placard or would raise her placard and say the delegate of Russia would like to challenge the delegate of USA on the working paper for a time duration of three minutes which means I have been challenged to discuss this subtopic this working paper so the delegate of USA which is me and the delegate of Russia who raised the challenge will both be called to the floor and then the discussion on the challenge will work for three minutes now after the three minutes are over both the delegates will go back to committee I mean we'll go back to their seats and then continue with normal debate and how is this helpful so on the basis of the challenge the rest of the committee is viewing these two delegates whilst they are debating and discussing over the working paper so this will be helpful for the committee to decipher whether they should vote yes on the working paper or no on the working paper when it does come to voting so this is the entire region uh, this is the entire reason beg your pardon why a chat how and why a challenge can be used it can be helpful in many ways especially when the committee is unsure what to vote or if they want some clarity or they, if they want if there is a dispute between two countries a challenge is the best way forward Alright, uh, in the challenge if another delegate 
is raising allegations against us, we can ask him directly for an evidence and what are legitimate sources of evidence. Yes, of course, you can ask him for evidence. Any UN website, UN associated website, Reuters, BBC are all uh, accepted as legitimate sources for evidence. Not your Google, not Wikipedia and those websites. You can definitely ask for evidence if an allegation is raised against you. Moving forward, um, point or clause number 32 is question answer session. What is question answer session? As the name suggests, it's very simple. It's when you have, when a particular country has a lot of questions to ask a particular delegate, they might raise a motion to move into a question answer session with that particular delegate. In a question answer session, the maximum time period that is can be given is 10 minutes and the maximum number of questions that can be asked is also 10. So what does that mean? When many delegates <clears throat> need to ask questions to one particular delegate, they may call for a question answer session by raising their placard and saying motion to move into a question answer session with the delegate of ABC country for a total time period of XYZ minutes. So please note that question answer session is maximum for 10 minutes and a total number of question. Again, this is maximum of 10 questions. All right. So that's your question answer session. Now this tool too can be used just before a resolution is put to vote. So think about it. The author of the resolution is on the is on the floor discussing the resolution and discuss the points. He's read out the entire resolution or she has read out the entire re resolution. And now, of course, if the resolution, which is a solution to the main agenda is being discussed, there are going to be many countries who wish to ask questions to the author. So how can they do that? They can use question answer session and motion to move into this session with the author of the re resolution and then automatically 10 questions or a maximum of 10 questions can be asked to this resolution. Uh, Amish, you've written uh, the delegate of XYZ country would like to challenge the delegate of ABC on PQR topic for a time duration of your wish minutes. That's absolutely correct. The only thing is you also have to add a line which is total number of questions would be dash. So the maximum time duration is 10 minutes and the maximum number of questions that can be asked is also 10 minutes. So the line goes this way. Motion to move into a question answer session with the delegate of ABC country for a total time period of XYZ minutes and total number of questions to be at PQR. You, there is no limit on the number of motions that you utilize. So Ketan, you can raise a question answer session before every resolution that is being introduced or before every working paper that goes into voting. There is no limit on the same. Moving on to clause number 33, which is one for one against. So one for one against is also a brilliant tool, which is usually utilized at the time when a committee is blank blank in the sense they're not sure whether to vote yes or no on a particular working paper or resolution so when a committee cannot usually decide on a particular issue before the final vote is being cast they hear both sides of an argument through the help of this clause called one for one against so did you understand Whenever a committee is just about to go into voting and before it goes into voting in order to get that final clarity, in order to get that final clarity before they go into the voting, they would like to hear two people speak about that particular working paper or resolution before they vote. So they can have a one for one against, one for one against beg your pardon, which can also be extended up to a two for two against, which means 
that one person will speak for that particular topic or resolution or working paper that's on display and one person will speak against the duration that is given per speaker is one minute and it is formal so I am speaking for you are speaking against so I'll speak for one minute for this particular working paper then you will take one minute and speak against this working paper and tell the committee why exactly this working paper should not be passed on the basis of both our speeches of a minute each the committee gets certain clarity and is able to decide after hearing from both sides of the argument whether to vote yes or no so one for one against is very important because it it can be used by you to influence the committee against or in favor of a particular working paper resolution that you are entering into voting for all right um, please repeat how to raise a motion for a challenge sure Vikrant uh, you uh, you said one for question mark it's called one for one against and in regards to uh, Aisha's question please repeat how to raise a motion for a challenge sure a challenge is basically you say these words motion to challenge the delegate of ABC country over PQR topic for a time duration of LMN minutes so your minutes is maximum of three minutes when it comes to challenge so motion to move motion to challenge rather motion to challenge the delegate of ABC country over PQR topic for a time duration of LMN minutes and the maximum time duration in challenge is three minutes in question answer session is 10 minutes and in one for one against you get one minute per speaker and one for one against can also be extended to two for two against all right uh, clause number 34 out of the 38 clauses that we have to discuss clause number 34 is formal voting what exactly is formal voting I would request all of you to pay attention to this because this is slightly uh, more advanced it's how you normally have informal voting and simple majority that has got you to passing any and every motion up till now it is a resolution that requires two-third majority that we've already discussed which means it uses formal voting is required for a resolution wherein two-third majority is required so what is formal voting it's broken up into three rounds all right so formal voting is done for passing of a resolution which requires two-third majority to be passed it's broken up into three rounds during voting of course you don't have any logistical members any IP members any observers in your committee it's just the executive board member and the com committee delegates so there are three rounds that formal voting is broken up into round one is where each country is given six op options to choose from so alphabetically the executive board person will say the name of the country and the country will raise their placard and tell the executive board member which option they've selected so in round one the six options that you get are option number one yes option number two no option number three yes with rights option number four no with rights option number five abstain and option number six pass so there are six options is yes no yes with rights no with rights abstain and pass so those are your six options that you get in round one now I'll explain what each of the options mean it's very simple just pay attention yes is of course you're voting yes for round one for the resolution no is you're saying no your country does not want to vote I mean your country wishes to not pass this resolution so that's no 
third one is yes with rights and the fourth one is no with rights what does with rights mean with rights basically means that you want to give a justification to your vote so if you say yes with rights it means i vote yes for this resolution and i want to justify to the entire committee with the help of a one minute speech why i have said yes on the other hand if i select no with rights it means i have said no for this resolution and i would not like to pass it and i would like to use a minute speech to justify and point out the reasons to the entire committee why i have said no so that's yes no yes with rights no with rights your fifth option is pass wherein you pass and choose not to vote in round 1 because you are unsure whether you are going to vote yes or no so for this round you choose to pass and you might vote in the next round and the sixth option is abstain abstain is where you say that i don't cast my vote i don't wish to vote yes nor do i wish to vote no so abstain is you refuse from casting a vote you don't vote all right so there are three rounds in formal voting round 1 round 2 round 3 in round 1 you have six options your six options that are given is yes no yes with rights no with rights abstain and pass yes and no is simple it means yes i vote i pass this and no means i do not wish to pass this resolution with rights basically allows you a minute long speech to justify why you've said yes or no abstain says you do not wish to cast a vote because this particular resolution does not affect your country as such whereas pass says that i'm on the fence and i'm not sure so basically um the question is what is the difference between pass and abstain pass is basically you are unsure whether you want to vote yes or no and you will vote next round whereas abstain is you do not vote at all so if i am a country who feels that whether this resolution passes or fails it doesn't make a difference to me or to my country then i'll abstain and i won't cast a vote because it doesn't make a difference to me but if i am a country who's not understood what gains am i going to get if this particular resolution is passed or what losses am i going to make or what is going how is it going to affect my country how is it going to affect my country if i pass or fail this resolution if i say yes or no to this resolution so in that case you choose pass all right so round 1 is pretty clear six options it is compulsory to vote in round 1 you have to select one of these six options then you move to round 2 So round two is interesting. There is no voting in round two. So make note, there is no voting in round two. What does that mean? That all the delegates, you remember they had said with rights. That means they wanted to give that minute long speech and justify to committee, rather convince committee why they have said yes or why they have said no. So all the people with rights get a chance. to speak for a minute each however make note that we enter into round 2 only and only if there is someone or any country that has actually opted for the option pass in round 1 all right i'll rephrase myself round 1 you get six options round 2 you don't have voting round 2 is the round where you have the speeches but keep in mind that all those who said yes with rights or no with rights are given the platform to speak only if there is someone who has selected the option pass in round 1 so if in round 1 there are 10 people who said yes with rights but no one who said pass then you automatically skip round 2 but on the other hand if in round 1 there is one person also who has said pass and 25 people who have used yes with rights and no with rights combined then 25 speakers will speak in round 2 for a minute each 
and then we move on to round three. All right, is that understood? So round one, you have six options. Yes, no, yes with rights, no with rights, pass and abstain. Round two, you don't have voting. You have the speeches. So round two is where you have speeches, which means you don't have any voting but you enter round two for speeches only if someone has voted pass in round one. All right. Now you have round three. Now in round three, the delegates have to cast their final vote. And the options that you get here are three. Yes, no and abstain. Okay, Madhur has asked what will they speak? So let me just explain to you that suppose I am a country who wants to pass this resolution. I will say yes with rights. Correct? What will I speak in round two? I will speak about all the positive impacts of this resolution so as to convince all the others who have said pass to come on my side and vote yes. It's as simple as this. There are five people, for example, who have said pass in round one. That means five people can either say no, can say yes or can abstain. So I will use round two to give a speech on the benefits of this resolution, on the gains of this resolution and convince those five people who have said pass to change their vote to yes in round three, which will help my cause because I want this resolution to pass. So did you understand Madhur and uh, Amal you asked can I change my decision from a no to yes from round two to round three yes so whatever discussion whatever your uh, vote was in round one and can be changed in round three only keep in mind that the author of the resolution cannot be voted against. I mean, he cannot be vote. He cannot vote against his own resolution or her own resolution. Yes, Harsha. If there is no person who said pass in round one, then people who selected the option with rights, they do not, they do not get to speak in round two. Um. Amisha, uh, Amish Agarwal, sorry, Amish Agarwal, we don't have anything called present and voting in Iman Rules of Procedure. All right, Amal, I'll look into that. You can definitely change your vote uh, in round three because round three is the round that takes place after you've heard the speeches of people in round two. So if you've heard someone's speech and you feel that, okay, this what this person said, really makes sense and I should change the way that I've cast my vote then you can definitely do that and go forward and change your vote all right only keeping in mind that if you're the author you cannot change your vote and you cannot vote no on your own resolution so it's mandatory for your for the author to vote yes otherwise you can vote anyhow all right uh, moving on from formal voting we just have a few points three to four points left there's something called as clause by clause voting which is in formal voting so what is clause by clause voting instead of voting entirely on the on the full agenda on the full resolution you vote on each clause so say if your resolution has 20 clauses you read out one clause and the entire committee votes on one clause then you read out the second clause and the entire committee votes on the second clause. So like that, you vote 20 times on clause by clause voting. But now clause by clause voting takes place via informal voting, not formal voting. So you discuss 20 clauses, you vote on them informally to pass or fail them. After you've discussed 20 clauses, then you have a formal voting on the entire resolution. 
so clause by clause is a lengthy process as compared to normal voting but then again it's this it's voting upon each clause and ensuring that each clause is checked and heard and discussed in committee all right there are a few questions um does it skip into round 3 from round 1 if there is no pass absolutely so round 1 you have six option if no one has passed you don't go to round 2 you directly go to round 3 and in round 3 you have three options which is yes no or abstain all right how many clauses are needed to pass a resolution um and what are clauses okay simple uh suppose you have a resolution a resolution is made up of clauses so that will definitely be explained to you when we are doing resolution writing maybe not today but it will be explained to you there's something called as preambulatory clauses and operating clauses so you can just think of them as points so there 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 are lines in your resolution so suppose you have 20 of these clauses you have to if you choose clause by clause voting then you just read every clause and vote on it first so it's just like saying you have 10 points in your resolution you read point number 1 and then you vote on it from in an informal manner whether to pass or fail it then you read point number 2 which is actually clause number 2 in the resolution and then you have an informal vote on that then you have 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 so you go through each point or each clause and you vote on it in an informal manner if you choose clause by clause voting and then you do a formal voting for the entire resolution so you have two ways one you directly go into voting for the entire resolution in a formal voting manner second is if you choose clause by clause voting then you first have informal voting on each clause and then one final formal voting on the entire resolution now uh, moving on we have the next point which is tabling so someone had asked me what exactly was tabling of a working paper so tabling is basically putting aside so it's as simple as if you're discussing either a working paper a resolution or a declaration so what is tabling if you're discussing either a resolution a working paper or a declaration and you feel that it's redundant to right now discuss this particular working paper or the committee feels that the committee is wasting time discussing this particular declaration or this working paper or this resolution it can motion to table a particular resolution which means you put that particular resolution on on hold and you put it aside and you continue with your committee proceedings all right so have you understood what exactly is clause uh, what exactly is tabling of resolution or working paper or declaration all right uh, varun you've asked what if some clauses get passed and some clauses don't during clause by clause voting so the clauses that don't get passed they are removed from the resolution and the clauses that get passed are kept in the resolution and then once you finish clause by clause voting you have then again a final voting which is a formal in nature on the entire resolution so suppose you had 20 points 20 clauses you did clause by clause voting say 15 passed and 5 were removed so now you have a 15 clause resolution after clause by clause voting then you will move into a formal voting on the entire resolution but the resolution of the 15 clauses not of the 20 clauses yes uh, for tabling uh, do you need to vote for tabling of the resolution yes you need to vote for tabling of a resolution or a working paper or a declaration at any point in time during council and it requires 2/3 of informal vote so if you have 2/3 majority in informal voting you can just table a particular working re res uh, resolution working paper resolution or de declaration
All right. Uh, now I'm going to move forward. I'll just put a pause to your questions. I'll answer the questions after we finish. There are only three points left. Point number 36, 37 and 38. What is point number 36? Clause number 36 of the Indian International MUN Rules of Procedure is presidential statement. What is presidential statement? I'm sorry, the camera is moving quite a bit. What is presidential statement? Basically, a delegate can raise his placard and say something called as presidential statement. What is presidential statement? It basically assumes that the head of state of that particular country has entered the committee. So if there's a presidential statement that is raised, then you assume that on behalf of USA, Donald Trump has entered the committee and is sharing a few words. Presidential statement is can be used in multiple ways. Sometimes students use it because they feel that maybe they're not getting re recognized and if they use presidential statement, it will uh, ensure that the executive board member addresses and looks favorable upon a president or a head of state of a con country visiting the committee. So in short, basically a delegate during the course of debate can make a presidential statement. There is a maximum limit, which is three which means throughout the conference you can use presidential statement thrice and why is this done so this is done by a country to help them to express their views or give statements on particular issues so if there's a lot of controversy or commotion in committee and you feel that a presidential statement by the head of state of your committee of your country is going to help calm the situation or if you feel that a particular issue will be expressed better or addressed better if your head of state addresses it, then you can use this. This is followed by a yield to questions where maximum two questions can be entertained. So now that's pretty simple. So presidential statement is when your it is assumed that your president has the head of state of your country has entered the committee and would like to address the council. You need to keep in mind that any of these points that you use, if you're using them to the benefit of the council and to the benefit of your committee to enhance debate, you get marks for that. So if you use question answer session wisely, you use a challenge in the right way, you use presidential statement for its purpose and not to disrupt committee and create a ruckus. If you use it for all the right reasons, then these, these, uh, if you use the ROP for all the right reasons, then in the ROP section of your marking, you get good marks. If you just use presidential statement to irritate the rest of the committee or to trouble your executive board member, then it's not looked favorably upon. All right. Yes, it's three per country. So. A country can use presidential statement thrice over in the entire conference. So you can break it up to one a day or you can use all three in one day. That's your choice. Okay, moving on to the second last clause, which is clause number 37. Uh, it's ROP, uh, which is uh, rules of procedure not ROB, we aren't robbing any bank here, it's rules of procedure, ROP, P for parrot, P for procedure. Clause number 37 is joint statement. What is a joint statement? Two countries can come together and make a joint announcement regarding their views on a particular topic area. So two particular countries discussed with each other and they felt that there are certain change in country policies that they must announce together. So what they do is they write a chit, they write on a piece of paper or on a chit and they send that chit to the chairperson to read. So the chairperson reads the joint statement first. If your executive board member or your chairperson
feels that this committee uh, i mean this joint statement is in context to the agenda and the topic of discussion then it's great he will allow it and he will allow it to go forward but on the other hand your chairperson or your executive board member has the discretion to invalidate the statement if it is not important and is not in context to the agenda so it's as simple if your joint statement is pertaining to your topic of discussion then it is entertained else it is not all right now moving forward your last point is censure clause number 38 of the iman rules of procedure is censure c e n s u r e what exactly is censure i am sure you guys would have heard of impeachment wherein you can impeach your chairperson if you feel they are not adequately prepared similarly similar to impeachment censure is against or is towards a particular co delegate or a fellow delegate in your committee what does this mean if a particular delegate in the committee is being troublesome or is not allowing committee to function in the right way or is being a problematic to the rest of the council with a two third majority of informal vote you can censure a delegate and remove him from council or remove her from council so i if i am the delegate of syria for example or if i am the delegate of iran and if a lot of delegates feel that i am just making a ruckus in committee and not paying attention and not allowing others to focus or raising points and motions which are not valid or i'm doing any unparliamentary behavior not speaking properly there is many problems that are against this particular delegate so what you can do is you can censure a fellow delegate or remove a fellow delegate from committee by motioning for it and in order for it to be successful you need two third majority through an informal vote and the only way that this can be overruled is by your chairperson so you can just raise your placard and you can say motion to censure the delegate of iran then the executive board member will ask the committee all those in favor all those who are in actual favor of removing the delegate or censuring the delegate of iran will raise their placards and if there is two third majority through informal vote that delegate is censured and asked to leave the committee and is barred from committee the only way this can be overruled is through the discretion of your chairperson with that we come to the end of today's session and a 38 clause long rules of procedure of iimun i am sure there are a lot of queries that you might still have which is why there will in all likelihood be someone to assist you so in the comment sections too we have put up an email address of the uh, eb.india.iman wherein any queries that you have can be addressed and sent across to us and we'll definitely get back to you apart from that you have the rules of procedure which is available on the website you have these training sessions which are recorded and saved and are available on this facebook page any doubts you have you can get in touch with your teachers or through any of these patterns and get in touch with us you can email us write to us facebook message us get in touch with us through our website and we'll be more than happy to help you your future sessions the few queries that were unanswered i'm sorry uh, i was just trying to make sure that the flow is maintained and we don't take too many breaks so if by mistake i skipped a couple of questions i sincerely apologize for that and we'll ensure that your questions are answered shortly or in the next session most definitely Till then it was a pleasure speaking to you guys and would like to wish all of you all the very best your i hope that you guys have a great conference and see you at the next training session bye thank you